So I think the first time we ever do another climate strike, whether that be in you know three months, four months, or maybe a year's time, I think it's going to be a massive occasion, and it's just going to be really exciting. And that's the sort of energy we need to to really push ourselves to the next level and to keep campaigning. Hello, and welcome back to Hot and Bothered. In this series, you'll meet the activists behind the placards who are passionate about making positive change in the face of the climate crisis. Listen to their views, challenges, and tips on being heard and making a change. In this episode, we'll hear from a range of activists from around the world about how they've stayed inspired throughout the pandemic. The conversations were recorded remotely over Zoom as the world went into lockdown back in May last year. Sorry, I'm quite new to Zoom. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I'm almost overly used to Zoom, so it's refreshing. <laughs> We'll head to Bali first, where we'll hear from Malati Wisen about the physical and mental toll that full-time activism can have on such young people in this movement. Malati is the founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags, which played a vital role in banning all plastic bags and straws on the island of Bali. She's also the founder of Youthtopia, a global project to empower youth through short peer-to-peer education, guided by the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. given us this time and this place to actually refocus on things that actually matter um you know and this is particularly important for me because i i'm 19 and i've had uh you know burnouts um and and this is a trend that we do see among young change makers around the world that are super on it on top of it frontline change makers you know always at it and uh, we experience burnouts and i think that uh the reason why is because we were going at such a fast rate and um i think this this covid 19 or this pandemic has really allowed us that space to refocus, re-strategize, and start really preparing for, um, you know, the next phase of the plan, which is what's life going to look like after COVID-19? How are we going to play a part in shaping that? So for me, that entire uh, idea um, really keeps me inspired. Uh, A lot of talks like this, uh, kind of getting to know people that I've never actually met in person, but have the same sort of connection, I really enjoy um, that that's a possibility. Um, so I keep myself kind of fresh like that. <laughs> now we'll hear from Vanessa Nakati and Evelyn Aikam about how they've managed to stay inspired and focused to continue their activism work throughout the pandemic. Vanessa and Evelyn are both amazing climate justice activists campaigning throughout Africa. Uh, well, uh, the greatest inspiration for me comes from the fact that uh, there are quite a number of activists from different parts of the world. To me, it's a form of solidarity to see that many young people from different parts of the world are working together to reach the same vision, to reach the same goals, and to see the change that we are all seeking for. So that is already an inspiration to know that as an activist, I am not working alone, and that there are quite a number of activists from different parts of the world who are demanding for action from the government leaders. Um, myself, my greatest inspiration this in this lockdown to continue advocating for climate justice has been the responses on social media, the reception. It has not been bad. Yeah, most 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 of the responses have been very good. People are actually following what we are doing. People are encouraged to continue to con- people are encouraged to join the movements. Like I have different friends that have been able to that have been inspired to start to, 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 to read more about climate change. And they're actually interested, they want to start, they want to join the activism of climate. So there are responses from social media and also the fact that there are very many different activists all over the world striking, the likes of Uta Thunberg, the likes of Vanessa Nakate. So this encourages a lot. And also the, the media, like right now, you're, you're doing this interview. This shows that actually, we are being noticed out there. Different media houses have been have been calling in, have been calling to interview us. Yeah, and we've had different webinars, different meetings online on climate, on climate change and climate justice. And this encourages us to keep going. This encourages us to keep doing what we are doing. You don't feel like you're alone. You feel like actually people out there are watching and they're following what you're doing. 
last years. That's great. How, how did you both initially find your passion for the environmental movement? My passion for environmental, for, for climate activism began. Uh, it didn't start right away when I was growing up. It's, it's been an interesting journey, actually. Yeah. First of all, I've grown up in a country that experiences two, two different types of, of, of climates two different types of, of, of climate, and that is the, the wet and dry season. Yeah, and I actually thought this was the same all over the world. Yes, and also the fact that, the fact that our education system does not, does not provide accountability on climate change and climate justice. Yeah, this pushed me more to go back and read about climate, about what is, what is happening around us, what's happening with our nature. Then also watching my friend Vanessa go do her individual strikes on the street. So her passion and vigor inspired me a lot to go back and read about climate change and the, the, the different conversations I've had with her and shared with her pushed me to go back and do more research. And yes, here I am doing the climate change activism. Well, for me, uh, I remember in the year 2018, I wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my community. Um, therefore, I started carrying out research to understand the challenges that the people face. And I was really surprised to find that climate change was one of those problems, simply because of what Evelyn has explained. In our schools, climate change is taught as something that either happened in the past or something that is coming in the far future that we don't have to worry about. So it's more of the theoretical way of learning about climate change, not the fact that climate change is real. And here I was looking at my research telling me that climate change was happening right now and that the people in my community, for example, in the Mount Elgon area, in Kasese, they have suffered with changes in weather patterns with short rainy seasons, causing flooding, landslides, increasing water levels of lakes and busting of rivers. So you find that uh, many people are staring at climate change in the face right now. And the moment I realized this, I decided that I had to do something about it. So I started reading about ways of creating uh, awareness for a challenge or a problem in society. And that is how I got to know about the Fridays for Future movement. And I decided that if Greta was able to start the strikes in her country, then I would do the same in my country and try and create awareness. I also caught up with Kevin Patel from Los Angeles to see how he was coping. Kevin is the director of One Up Action, an intersectional youth-led organisation working to provide resources to youth advocates. We all have a voice, we just have to use it. That's the most powerful tool that we have right now is that we have our voices. We just have to learn how to use it. You know, we were all born with a voice. We just have to know how to use that as a tool to make sure that other communities that are marginalized all around the world are able to really have their voices uplifted and making sure that we're using our voices not just for ourselves, but for others. And it's interesting you say that because I think right now, especially um, people in the global south, many people don't have access to internet to join these online strikes. So do you think their voice is still being carried across the platform? Definitely, it's so hard to see that, you know, I've spoken to many global act uh, global South activists. I know that, you know, in, specifically in India um, and in Asia as well, it is very hard to access the internet. I know in some parts and um, in some villages as well. And it's, you know, for me, that is just devastating. I, you know, um, it, it's a wake up call for all of us to say that we have a sense of privilege to even get on these calls or even get on these, or even have these opportunities to have our voices heard. Um, it should be a wake up call for everyone, and especially world leaders saying that, you know, these people are being affected not only by the climate crisis, but now by COVID-19 um, and by all these systems of oppression that have been, you know, been placed on our backs for a long time. Um, but yeah, it makes it harder for them to access, you know, and even have their voices heard. Um, 
And that is, it, it's sad to say, but, you know, the lucky few that are able to even have the privilege of logging on on a computer and really mm -hmm. accessing the online world and joining these Zoom calls from the global south, they all say it, you know, they are all saying it that it is very hard for other community members or even even other people to join these type of calls. Um, you know, I know um, in Africa specifically, I know, you know, in Kenya, I know some activists that are saying that it's very hard for them to join because they don't have as, as much as money to afford, you know, internet or anything like that, or even have uh, good phones to get on calls or anything like that. So sometimes when they join calls and we're on calls with them, it's very hard to hear or stuff like that. And we just have to recognize that we have a sense of privilege of having technology, others might not. And we need to fix that right away so that people do have a voice, you know, these dark times, you know, uh, because they are dark times, not just for um, people in the United States, but people around the world. Um, and especially for our activists, they're not being able to have their voices heard. Remaining optimistic can be a challenge during times like this. And I was curious to hear from the activists about their hopes for the future of the movement. Well, uh, for the climate justice movement, um, my hopes, of course, they're, they're positive hopes and uh, the feeling that we'll be able to get the change that we are demanding for. And the only way that we'll be able to do that is by being persistent and not giving up. Because the moment we lay our guard down, then our leaders will take uh, any kinds of decisions that will put our planet at risk. We are already seeing some of the leaders saying that um, they can continue with their uh, maybe coal industry simply because uh, the activists cannot protest because of the lockdowns. And to me, that is really being so shameless and being so inhuman to actually say that people will not protest, so let us go on and do this. So meaning that they know that their decisions and their actions are actually dangerous for the people and for the planet, but as long as they satisfy their greed. So I really hope that um, the climate movement continues to be as active and as strong as it has been, and for activists not to give up and to keep demanding for the action that they need because the demands of the activists are clear so i really hope that these demands remain clear and uh, the voices remain clear and the messages remain clear and to have more honesty and um, i think more genuine people so that we can be able to get the change that we need and then i also hope that uh, the climate justice movement doesn't only stop at uh, creating awareness. I hope that it can get involved in uh, maybe grassroots uh, projects in their communities. You know, I believe that yes, climate awareness is good, but also driving the climate solutions is good as well. So I really hope that the climate justice movement uh, adds something to its uh, to its activism awareness and solutions in the communities where they are most uh, affected by by the climate crisis and then uh, well i think i think that's it that's what i really hope to see and i hope to see that actually the activists stop um, just endorsing the right candidates on social media and i hope to see them go out and vote because many times they'll say this is the best candidate and they'll do all kinds of endorsements on twitter on instagram but at the end of the day they will not step out to go and vote so i really hope that uh, the many activists in the climate justice movement uh they move from just endorsements to actually going to the ground and doing the voting because that is the only way that will put the right leaders into power yeah first of all i had an experience recently which was so frustrating uh i went to the parliament to raise my voice i went with a placard as my friend vanessa had done it before so I was like, let me do this also. 
So I go with I go with my message on the placard about climate change and COVID nineteen, and I talk to the I talk to this officer at the parliament at the gate, and the officer the officer denies me denies me the chance to stand in front of the parliament, and this is the statement he made. He told me, uh, "Why do you want to threaten the government?" Are you trying? Sorry, this was a question. Are you trying to threaten the government? Why do you, why do you particularly want to stand here? And that was so disturbing. So when I left Parliament, I went to another office, which which is also still under the government, and they still refused me to carry out my strike. So I was so disturbed. I actually contacted Vanessa. Yeah, but uh, I'm hoping that after this lockdown is lifted, I I pray and hope that our leaders the people in the people in power right now the police officers can let us do this because this is for a good cause yeah this is for everyone we are fighting for everyone i i hope that they actually give us a chance they give anyone who's fighting for the environment because you're not actually provoking the government here you're fighting for you're fighting for your environment which is something good and finally, we'll hear from George Coombs to provide some much needed positivity and encouragement. George is a climate justice activist from Manchester in England. I think it's, it's just going to be really exciting to see all the work we put into and the work we've done on campaigns and how we've almost congratulated each other for navigating a global pandemic and actually still being able to, to keep the climate movement alive and well. Um, and whilst I do agree that we've had a great opportunity to, to, to look at how we can make things digital and virtual. I think it's going to be a great opportunity for us to then take everything we've done and start to celebrate ourselves and continue that fight in person. Um, so we've got to look forward and we've got, we've got to see um, what's coming in the future. And I think when we get to the point when we can actually organise the first climate strike in person, face to face, um, when we've got our placards up again and we're having those conversations and the noise is there and the atmosphere is there, all the people who we've managed to rally together and to empower to be part of this movement who might not previously have thought they could or had the time, you know, they'll start to understand that they can prioritise their own time to be present for a climate strike. You know, they've done it previously on an online platform. They can do it face to face as well. So I think the first time we ever do another climate strike, whether that be in you know, three months, four months, or maybe a year's time, I think it's going to be a massive occasion and it's just going to be really exciting. And that's the sort of energy we need to, to really push ourselves to the next level and to keep campaigning. So there we have it. I hope that's provided you with a little bit of positivity to continue campaigning and keep your head up during these times. I'd love to know how you've stayed inspired throughout the pandemic. So do feel free to drop a comment on the YouTube video. I'd like to thank all of the activists who've joined me remotely to make this episode possible. Make sure you give them a follow on social media to stay up to date with all the amazing work that they're doing. You can also find us on social media with the handle at drivedocs. Look out for our next episode where I'll be speaking to activists about the controversial HS2 infrastructure project here in England. One of the hidden agendas of HS2 is a massive land grab. More land is being taken like this that isn't actually the, lot, the, the railway line itself. It's associated development. Um, and so they would then sell off that. They would take public land, which is left for people in perpetuity, um, and privatise it, sell it off for uh, off a stock and make millions of pounds. That's their sort of longer-term plan. Um, and so we're here to oppose that, say, protect the gardens, and also to help bring about the... The, you know, HS2 is going to get cancelled at some point because we're in a climate and ecological emergency and it makes no sense, it's got no business case. We're trying to bring that date forward when it gets cancelled and we're also trying to then use the cancelling of HS2 to help really shift things around with the climate and ecological emergency so people really start to take appropriate action on it and, act and treat it like an emergency before it's too late because we risk societal collapse and the loss of everything we love if we don't act really soon. And that's like the science is so clear on that. So that's why we're here in tunnels under Euston Square Gardens, because it's the most effective thing we can do to address that wider climate and ecological emergency and bring about the system change that we need. The system that created these problems is the same system that created HS2. So we need to change all of that. And HS2 is our opportunity to bring about that change. This is a podcast for Drive Docs and was hosted and stitched together by me, Chris Healy. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you in the next one.